How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez, the Figure Four Weekly, with us. And, of course, our special guest today will be Daryl Peterson, Max Payne, Man Mountain Rock. He's several different names. He'll be up in about a half an hour. We'll talk to him about the current scene, his career, and we'll catch up on all of the news. And there's no shortage of news today, of course. And certainly tons of emails that we'll try to get to as many as we can as well. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. That's good. You're still here. I you know, I'm still in the house. Oh, I was shocked at home. the number of people that believe that I was actually at your house. Yes, but uh, actually, this is this is what Brian is going to sound for the rest of our lives. He had a voice transplant over the weekend, and actually during the week. I got the box anyway. put in. Yep. In my throat. <laughs> I know, the cane box. For all, those, for all that time, you know, for... Oh, God, we got right. bored here. What? A voice changer. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this isn't the oh. Howard Stern show. Okay, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, I guess, let's see. SmackDown did a 4.9 rating, which is, actually considering what it was up against, it's pretty good. That was the last show after WrestleMania. They did the big angle on Monday. Not, not too surprising. Uh, Gene Okerlund and Bobby Heenan are at the Fan Fest as we speak in Houston, and uh, they are going to be announcing the uh, gimmick battle royal, which... It's a big deal on the internet, but it has not been hyped on television. I, it's one of those things where, and I saw like this, this, they had a poll of like the match you're most looking forward to at WrestleMania, and it was like first, and a Rock and Awesome was second, and it's like I think that's why like these polls mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a letdown to a lot of people too. Well, the the ring entrances will be the the whole match because if they yeah. go any length of time, I mean it's you know real battle royals with with real wrestlers are really not are usually horrible. Good. Yeah, they're usually horrible, and, and they usually have them at WrestleMania, so guys get payoffs, and they're all, invariably the worst match on the whole show. Mm -hmm. So this one, I mean, Sheik and Volkov, I mean, we've seen those guys. Oh my Volkov, God. I'm not so worried about, but the Iron Sheik, how long well, ago was that Here's a Wrestling show? That was like a year and a half ago, right? Yeah, yeah, October I was afraid 99. he wasn't going to make it out of that show. Uh, he, he may never and get out of the ring. he didn't have to take a bump over the top rope at that show either. Uh, I don't think he's going to, well, we'll see. We'll see how he how he does that. I don't know. Do not know. Uh, let's see. The MLL pay per view is tonight uh, with Perro Aguayo against Mascara Anya. Speaking of people who can't take bumps over the top <laughs> rope, <laughs> that match is going to Perro Aguayo against Universo Dos Mil. Uh, and actually, the undercard will probably be really good. And hopefully, I'll have a tape of that one towards the latter part of this coming week. So um, so that'll be cool. I'm going to start. Getting into uh, more EMLL wrestling, actually starting this coming Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to use that extra time I got from not having to watch wrestling to start watching that. Uh, the Doink the Clown in the Battle Royal is going to be Gary Fall, who also was known as Ray Apollo, and I think those are the names he was, and also Doink the Clown. Uh, so, he was the, so he was the second Doink, because Matt Osborne was the first one, and then Matt Osborne got into trouble, as he always does, <laughs> and uh, they had to get a new Doink. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, Shawn Michaels, I am presuming strongly, will not be at WrestleMania uh, after all that buildup. Um, I was last night kind of told that that's how things are planned. And as far as what, if any, long-term plans they have for... Well, they have no long-term plans for Shawn Michaels now, I'm thinking. And, and I would be surprised to see him back at any time in the near future. But stranger things have happened. We'll, find, we'll try to find more out about that. And um, Man, what was Jim he Ross thinking at the time? What, Sean? Yeah. I don't get it. I mean, this is just... this just yeah, First day back. Ones. Everyone knows why he was gone. Just makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, it's like you don't come up. You don't come to work not ready to work after... They've kept him out for how long? You know, they made him, you know, like really eat it, you know, for all this time. And they, you know, bring him back at the last minute for, for the WrestleMania thing. And then he shows up Monday and Tuesday... And they were afraid to put him on the air, and it's just like, you know, you know. You know, and this, is, this is like his last chance. I mean, like, that's the reason he hasn't been around for all this time. I mean, it's a TV mm -hmm. personality. Everyone knows. You know, the fans are going to pop for him. Everyone, you know, likes him. They all respect that he was one of the greatest performers of all time. He's got kind of a legacy. And, you know, what can I say? You know, it's this, this, this one's his own fault, though. Especially yeah. sad because he had all those, uh, he was on the Internet regularly putting his columns up and doing the all... Well, you know, everyone writes these things about me, but uh, the fact is I'm a changed man. Things are different now. I'm a now. changed man. I have a wife and yeah. a kid. Yep, wife and a kid have changed me. 
Yeah. One of those things about changed men I've noticed in wrestling is that, like, you know, um, a lot of them just don't seem to change. Or if they change, they don't change for long. They change back when uh, they get in the arena. You know, that's the problem is, is, you know, sometimes they really do change when they get away from wrestling, but then as soon as you're back yeah. around the same people, you kind of end up doing the same things. I mean, the I know some other people. It's the environment. I know another, I, you know, I, without mentioning names, I just can recall another wrestler who, you know, changed and did change for the same reasons. And, and then I heard some reports on him, and, you know, he changed back too. Uh, let's see. Mexican wrestling legend Rolando Vera passed away last night of a heart attack at the age of 71. Um, I don't know a lot about him. I don't think that he ever wrestled in the United States. Um, he may have, uh, but I'm not. He, I know he, when I was, of course, he was done in wrestling by uh, the late 60s, so I would have never seen him, and um, I wouldn't even known. But I, I mean, I, I don't remember him ever wrestling in Texas or, or California, where a lot of the Mexican stars did wrestle. Uh, but he was NWA World Middleweight Champion. From 1956 to 1960, and um, let me see what other stuff do we got. Triple A is doing King of Kings tonight as well. Uh, let's see what else. Um, what do you think of SmackDown last night? I think the strangest thing of the whole SmackDown show was the fact that they did the Rock Austin angle in the middle of the show, and they had both guys arrested or whatever, taken away by security. Too the many cops the last the show, night. I was so sick of cops. I wanted to shoot those cops. Oh yeah, I know. And it was it was so dumb because you do an angle the week before where the cops are fake, and then the next week the cops are supposed to be real, and it's like you know, why why did Undertaker believe that the cops were real this week when they went to handcuff him? I guess he didn't because he beat him up. But uh, and then the whole thing, the arrest well, is so dumb. It's like, it's like he got he got he got arrested for um, re filing a restraining order, right? But not he, for like, attacking policemen. But then he beats up all these cops, and then, you know, Helmsley doesn't get arrested for, you know, smashing up a limousine with a sledgehammer. I mean, not a limousine. I mean, a the bike with a sledgehammer. And it's like, it's like the, the whole thing is just too, the, the cop thing is it's just too It just doesn't make any sense. Much, it's too much suspension of disbelief that makes no sense. Yeah, the, the, you know, it's like if you're going to have police arrest people during wrestling shows, then you can't do things... You know, overtly that they would, that when cops are on hand looking at you, you know, like the cops are like holding Undertaker and then Hunter sucker punches him right in front of the cops and he's not arrested. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Especially the whole thing with Undertaker coming out and he says, you know, I talked to a lawyer and I talked to a bail bond guy or whatever and I will be out of jail in 12 hours. And this is before he even got arrested. And then he caused all this havoc and we're supposed to believe that he talked to his lawyer and explained he was going to beat up cops and all this or, you know, how does it work? If you tell the bail bond guy that you're going to go kill somebody in advance, and he uh, says he'll get then you out in 12, 12 hours, and you go you kill a guy, you get out in 12 hours. Well, yeah, yeah. Even if you even if you have repeated arrests on a weekly basis every Monday night, there's yes. a pattern here. <laughs> it was just lame. And then, <laughs> different you know, they cities arrest all over them, the country. And it's like, you kind of expect. Well, they've been arrested in the middle of the show. They'll come back at the end of the show for the big angle, and big angle did not end up uh, involving them at all. They were gone, and. Uh, Steve Regal's music played at the end of the show before the uh, music video. I just thought that was kind of weird. No, 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 no. You missed the end of the show, Brian. The, the, the end of the show was Steve Austin. Oh, with Austin. Yeah, I guess you're right. Sorry. Okay, so That's you did right. see that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But there's no other angle. Yeah. I didn't think for a final show going into WrestleMania, I, boy, I didn't think it was a good show at all. No. Uh, I think they expected the first... like the music video was going to be the big hype for the show, but I fast-forwarded through it. Yeah. There was, um, I mean, I don't remember... The, the Hunter Undertaker thing at the very beginning, it just, I was really, I, I, I don't know, like, I was bored during that, the opening angle. And um, I liked the, uh, I thought Benoit did a good job, you know, when they got the ankle lock on him, when Angle, angle put the ankle lock on Benoit. And the way he tapped and sold it, I thought that was, you know, very professional and the right way to do it. And that was good. And then the rest, I don't know, just, uh, I think there was just whatever. something about that opening promo. It was one of those promos where they just talk for 20 minutes and say absolutely nothing. Which actually yeah, has been a lot like, of them lately, but this one in particular was like, Hunter, he was out there for 15 minutes, and the gist of what he was saying was, I'm going to beat The Undertaker. And then Undertaker comes out and talks for 10 more minutes, and all he said was, no, you're not. And that was it. <laughs> they should have done it in two minutes. Can't we have a little something, a little more meat in that interview? And the other thing, it, it just seemed like watching the show, that I was, it was like last week's SmackDown. Where you just feel like you're watching forever, and there's no wrestling, and even Raw, Raw on Monday, the last couple of shows, 
you're watching forever, and then you start thinking, you know, I'm actually seeing absolutely no wrestling on this wrestling show. Mm -hmm. You know, just like these long, long segments, you know, without actually anything going on in the ring, or when it does go on in the ring, you know, it's it's like, um, you know, the match goes on, and the match takes like a minute and a half to do the match. Yeah, let's see, they had five matches last night. Ivory and Trish was real short. Rhino and Matt Hardy was short. Yeah, and, real short. Uh, the, yeah. The, uh, the APA match, I mean, that thing was over right away. And One of the things on the face. shows that's been annoying me lately is the fact that uh, they do all the... I don't mind so much a replay on SmackDown of something that happened on Raw, but sometimes they'll do a replay on SmackDown of something that happened in like, the first hour of SmackDown, like maybe somebody missed that hour, and it seems like just a waste of time. I mean, it doesn't bother me so much because I fast forward, but I'm just thinking of these people that are watching it live and just I having to sit through all this nothing. I watch it live, and I think that you know, you know, and usually I usually I tape SmackDown and watch it later, and 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 often watch SmackDown in like in well under an hour and a half because of fast forward. But I decided to, to watch it live last night, mm -hmm. and it, it it was a lot slower moving to me than you know before. And all those replays, it was like, you know, God, I mean, there's so many chances to just, like, go up, you know, I mean, I, I kept getting that feeling of, you know, I just go upstairs and, like, you know, check my emails, you know what I mean? Cause, and then yeah, by the time yeah. I come down, the next match is already over, you know? It's like, oh, God. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I didn't think it was a good show. And certainly not, you know, for the last show before Mania. It didn't, I wasn't really any more hyped. In fact, I, I would say I ended the show, this is not good. I ended the show less excited about Mania than when I started the show. That's not a good mm -hmm. idea. I wasn't. I was a little bit excited about Austin and Rock, um, but I mean, I've been all, you know, I, I I would say the hype for Austin and Rock has not gotten me more excited than I was four months ago when I knew it was going to be that the main event. I was probably maybe even slightly more excited then. Um, they did a good job. I mean, I think they've done a good job far too late for the uh, Benoit Angle match, but but it's, what they've done has been good. Undertaker and Triple H, to, you know, like I was watching that stuff last night and it was like. I, I mean, their, their angles, you know, they, you know, Undertaker got to beat up Triple H a little bit, then Triple H got heat back. I mean, it was psychologically sound buildup, but I don't know what. It just didn't really work for me. I mean, yeah. maybe because it was, the, the interview dragged on so long. Um, it's just a long interview, and, you know, during the first interview, they really didn't have anything that, that, an issue between the two of them. They just didn't like each other. And then the issue ended up being over a motorcycle, and I wasn't particularly excited to see the match anyway, and that added absolutely nothing to it for me. But anyway, we will be on at uh, midnight Eastern Time, right after WrestleMania, the biggest show of the year. Four-hour show, then we'll be doing a one-hour post-game wrap-up, Brian and, I, and myself here on Yada.com. I'm sure everyone knows that, but we're going to mention it at least three or four more times in the next two hours. Uh, let's see, this is uh, our poll question for today. If you were Bill Goldberg, would you A, negotiate a buyout and sign with WWF, or B, sit and collect your money from Time Warner? Actually... Until you know the numbers, it's probably an, an unfair question. But uh, the way the numbers look out, I think, I think we know the answer on that one. This is uh, the poll question for uh, yesterday. How will the cancellation of WCW on television affect the time you spend watching wrestling? A, we'll spend more time watching WWF, 13%. Uh, B, we'll spend more time watching independent wrestling, 3%. That was not a good sign. Uh, C, we'll spend more time watching international wrestling, 10%. D will spend less time watching wrestling, 33%, and then stopped watching WCW a long time ago, so it will have no effect, 42%. Now, that makes no sense because we have far more than 42% of our listenership, you know, are, uh, usually say that they watch Nitro, except in the last three or four weeks. Not last week's show. Last week's show did pretty well. Uh, let me see. What else? Actually, that's the, any other main news? That's kind of the main news here. That's about it. All right. We could start hitting... Hitting emails here. Uh, I would see. like to plug a show tonight, by the way, at Edmonds Community College. I'm going to be wrestling on it. And it's a uh, startup group. And I don't want to get this wrong because these people would kill me, but I believe that the people that are helping put it together are the same people that promote the Pancration shows that uh, Josh Barnett works on. So Matt, Matt Hume? show up or they will beat you up. So is yeah, it Matt, is the Matt Hume people? I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. Like Matt I said, Hume I don't want to say uh, for certain because they would kill me, but... Uh, you know, they'll break your ankles, that's for sure. That's Speaking right. of which, we've got we to get Josh Barnett on this show. I am he may Al. be there tonight, so I can ask him. Well, yeah, Al, let's get Josh Barnett on the show. Let's do Just, that, but if Brian's going to be at the show... Brian, be if, if, you see, if you now. see him, tell him that uh, you know, we're going to... you know, Because when I saw him at UFC, I said, you know, like, uh, we're going to I, I, we're gonna put him on the show, and then he hasn't been on. So, so we should do that. 
Uh, uh, what else do we have here? I'll start with some emails here. Oh, also, I'm going to make mention that I'm going to be on with Mark Madden uh, at right after the show is over, actually, on uh, what's it? Uh, ESPN1250.com. So it's ESPN Radio with Mark Madden. We'll be talking about wrestling, believe it or not. And uh, I'm also going to be on with Larry Cutler in St. Louis tonight at 11, the Central Time. Hey, why don't you bring uh, up? Sh- to, why don't you bring up to Mark the uh, Jim Cornette hypothetical question story? Remember, about the canoe? About? Yes, about the canoe. And he said, "Remember, <laughs> he said, he said, Mark Madden, oh, you need a steamship for him." <laughs> yeah. And I'm doing up. Uh, what now? What show out tomorrow morning? I'm doing Howard Bloom. Now, what? What, what is that? ESPN Radio? No, it's not ESPN Radio. It's radio up in Canada. Give me, a, uh, give me a minute. When we come back from a break, I'll have that info for you. Okay. I'm just, like, running crazy here. Uh, anyway, uh, let's start with some of the emails. Let's see. We've got, uh, can you tell me, it's from Hector Veloz, who goes, uh, can you tell me what's the best mixed martial arts event on video? I would say the Pride Grand Prix from May the 1st of last year, if I had to pick one show and say that that was the best show with the Hoist Gracie, uh, Sushi Sakuraba 90 minute match. That would be, that would be my pick. That was an aw- you know, that tournament and everything, that was an awesome show. Um, uh, let's see. Ron Schindler, Schindler says, is it true that WCW had Bobby Eaton show for other wrestlers to and from various facilities during the Disney World Worldwide tapings in a golf cart? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know why uh, that'd be surprising. Yeah. Uh, let's see, my Faster own take on this rush to start up a second promotion is relax. What's the rush? Why not sit back, take a deep breath, see where McMahon is going, see what he isn't offering, then proceed to build your promotion around that void. Hey, no one's rushing. We're not going to have a, believe me, we're not having a second national promotion next week. Don't kid yourself, no matter what you hear. I'll tell you one thing, though. There are too many people out there wanting to establish themselves as number two. This is counterproductive to the cause. I, ought, I say that anyone with any intention of forming a startup should see if they can all work together for a common cause. Jerry Jarrett, J.J. Dillon. Dusty Rhodes, Eric Bischoff, it ain't going to happen. Everybody wants to be a chief. Nobody wants to be an Indian. Well, nobody's going to be anything if all these wannabes go at it alone. Okay. Uh, what else here? Uh, I was watching Hardys and Lita on Off the Record, listening to them talk about all the bumps they've taken and how much they worked during the past year. Got me thinking, wouldn't they, along with The Rock, be the right ones to send to WCW? That way they can get some of the rest, of, some rest on their bodies and give WCW a real good tag team to start. Of course, I'd like to see... Them team Kidman and Shane Helms and do a four, do a feud with the Hardys. Hey, that's a good idea. We talked about the Hardys. That that actually makes sense. It gives it gives Jeff a rest. Uh, Lead is kind of a big star right now. Rock would be good. You know, these are, these are all good ideas. Uh, do you know exactly what happened with Sean? You know what's going to happen in the end is going to be Billy Gunn. I know, I know. And then it's just going to be death. Uh, let's see. Do you know what happened with Sean at SmackDown? I think he fell asleep or something. I don't know. He, he just wasn't in, whatever it was, he was not in condition to perform, and they didn't let him perform, and he was not happy, and uh, that's the deal. Uh, this is from Trent Walters, who goes, I would prefer, this is actually a good letter, too. He goes, I prefer a 90-minute time slot for WCW. The late-night audience does not grow. You know, that's right. You know, from 11 to 1, you know, like traditional wrestling audience, you know, you're on 8 to 10, 9 to 11. The idea is is that you grow every quarter hour, which hadn't seemed to happen for Thunder a lot lately, and really not even for Nitro, but theoretically... Uh, even some of the Raws haven't done that lately, but th- generally speaking, that's what happens. Um, the late night audience doesn't grow, so building up a main event in the final 30 minutes will be counterproductive. That's a great point. If you're doing that, you got to pretty much have the main event on very early in the show if you're booking that kind of a show. And the problem with that is if you're doing a two hour TV show taping. used to do that? Wasn't it like the old Saturday Night Main Events? Used Saturday Night Main Event always did the main event events first. like first or they put the main event on first or second, right? Yeah. I think usually second. Um, and they always say and that was for an rest- hour show. You put a main event on first, and then go another hour and a half, or an hour and forty-five minutes after that. It's not gonna. It's gonna be bad news. It's gonna be tough. Well, think about also, also, also the live sh- the live crowd. Okay, you um, put the main event on early, and then you've got this live crowd that's already seen the main event, and then you want them to stick around for another hour. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but something you could do there is just you know do something simple like put on the main the TV main event first, and then you know and have a dark match main, main event. event. You think actually, like you can shoot an angle before the taping to lead to the off TV main event, and that way yeah, the people would have you know something built up for that main event to stay for. But uh, you know, TV audience would know nothing about it. Now here's another one. Also, what do you think about the idea of bringing, say, like uh, The Rock and Triple H or, or, or big names to the Wednesday television tapings? They don't appear on the show itself, 
but they're the main event in a dark match, so at least you know you have something that will draw a crowd. Because right now they don't have anything that will draw a crowd, obviously, because they haven't drawn any crowds. I think it'd be good, like at the beginning, just because they need something to build it up. But down the road, I mean, if they really want to build it up and it it uh, it gets to the point where it's drawing at least somewhat of a rating and they can do some pay per views, I think if they want to keep it separate, they need to get those guys out of there until they're ready for the interpromotional deal. At the beginning, though, I think it'd be awesome, though. Well, I think I think in the beginning you ha- I think the beginning you, you, you kind of have to, but we'll see. I mean, we'll find out anyway. Because uh, um, I think that uh, building something in the final thirty minutes will be counterproductive because a lot of the audience will have tuned out as well. I would rather see ninety minutes of good solid work and writing than have them try to fill two hours, two hours to lose the product. Finally, the reason Vince wouldn't give or TNN wouldn't give Vince a great a great time slot for the show is twofold. Number one, the XFL hasn't met the numbers Vince promised, so why should TNN believe that the WCW will? Actually, the, the because WCW it's though, is between football and wrestling. Yeah, it, it is his field of expertise, and football clearly is not. And number two, TNN executives think that TNN is more successful now due to the WF programming, not due to the WF programming, but due to the we've got pop brilliant marketing that is the envy of TV stations around the world. Yeah, I, you know, if you took that 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 no, those numbers for um for uh, for Raw out of the TNN and just averaged the other six nights uh, in prime time, I bet it wouldn't be all that much different than it was last season. I think that the the only differences is that they got that. That 4.7 to 5.3 or 4 every Monday night, which takes their 0.7 average up to like a 1.1 for the week. Mm-hmm. I, bet, I bet that's like mo- almost all of the gain. You hear that uh, Gilberg's going to be in the Battle Royal. Oh, it's another big yeah. name. Yeah, I tell you, you know, that if they do not have some sort of a deal with Bill Goldberg, putting Gilberg in the Battle Royal is really stupid. I mean, it's, it, they're, 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 they're building something up. This is something the WF has never ever done in, in its history: is build up on build up something in the fans' eyes that they want to see more than what they're presenting, that they're not going to de- that they're not going to deliver. And they've never done. I mean, that's one of the things that I've always admired about Vince McMahon as a promoter is the fact that he doesn't waste time swerving people on something he ain't going to follow up on. Generally speaking, and I don't, you know, you that's know, kind of been the whole Gilbert, thing with Gilbert from the beginning, though. Well, no, but at the beginning it was, it was, it was dumb because, from day one. No, but I mean the whole thing of why he did it before was it was like a way it was like a spoof on WCW. Mm-hmm. So now he's spoofing this guy who everyone thinks he's got now because they've been reading that you know they bought he bought the company that means he bought Goldberg except he didn't. People don't know he didn't. So he's like all it's going to do is get people to chant Goldberg. Wait for the Goldberg run in. I mean when that guy comes out, everyone in that building's going to think Goldberg's going to come out and spear him. And and spear everyone in the battle royal, and then they're going to get this horrible battle royal, and and it's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't think unless he does, unless they sign. You him know, another thing, it's it's nowhere near the level of Goldberg, but uh, it was in Jeff Merrick's SmackDown report last night. I didn't even think about this, but the fact that they showed a replay of Vince firing Jeff Jarrett, it's oh, almost like building up that Jeff Jarrett's going to show up with Shane. Oh, everyone's going to think that Jeff Jarrett's going to show up. I know, I know. Very strange. Uh. Well, we'll find out. Um, all maybe of the wrestlers, he just figures by, who cares what they expect because they're going to get something. Maybe he just thinks, hey, I own it all, and it, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, they may not get Jared, but they'll get Booker T, so they'll be happy. Um, yeah. The um, that's not a definite that Booker T is going to be there. Although I would, because I'm talking Booker's long term. Well, but yeah, yeah. Well, Booker T is going to be on May 12th on, on TNN. That's for sure. If you know, if that's the start date, which it probably will be. Uh, what was the the thing about uh, about all that? Um, oh, all of the uh, wrestlers, the 24 wrestlers that whose contracts were purchased by the WWF, they all got. I think they got notice Wednesday. I think it was. Um, you know, just and they were told to like fill out some form and send it. And when all of those things get back to the WWF office and everyone signed it, I think the WWF will then announce that we've signed these 24 guys and we'll get the actual list. The only name. That I heard got a form um, that, that we didn't know before, which I figured, but I didn't know for sure was um, was Alan Funk, who's Queewee. So you know, it's it's all the lower paid guys. Um, mm-hmm. as far, if if Booker T has made a deal, I think he may be the only one as far as the big. Well, I'm sure he's the only one if he has of the big names. Um, all of the ones that I've spoken with, uh, none of them have even been approached, let alone made a deal. Uh, most of the wrestlers have not. You know, the other wrestlers, as best I can tell, have not been. Approach. Have you heard of anyone being approached besides those 24 guys? No, that's it. Okay. So everything. That's where everything stands. Uh, Jim Ross in the Ross report made mention of um, 
you know, that, that they, they may have agents announced, and everyone assumes that that's um, Arn Anderson and Fit Finley. So it looks like they will probably be getting jobs. Uh, as far as announcers and all that, it's all subject. Who knows yet? Uh, let me see. This is where Shawn Michaels been. Uh, he's been home. I uh, thought he retired due to severe back injuries. Yes, he did. I hear talk of him coming back. Will he be commissioner again? Well, if he was, he's not going to be now. Uh, he's by far one of the greats. Uh, but uh, his, the height of his fame came several years before the WF became what it is now, which is unfortunate because had he stayed, he might have been able to reap some of the same kind of rewards Rock and Stone Cold have in today's media. You know what? He just self-destructed. I hate to say this, but um, if they had put him out there in the media, to where, in the position that Rock is in, uh, he would have been an embarrassment to the company. And um, that's why Rock and Austin are in the position they're in. Uh, let's see more, more ideas. Uh, I'd like to share with you my ideas for possible direction of the new promotion. I think Paul Heyman should be made in charge of booking. Uh, could happen, but unlikely. He should take all the former ECW talent along with him. Uh, not going to happen. Uh, that would include Rhino and Justin Credible. Also include Saturn and Raven. In a sense, they could resurrect ECW with an all-star lineup within the WCW time slot. Those days are over. It's over. <laughs> ECW is done. Okay. If WCW that, uh, is ECW over. crew could have turned things around, then they would have done it on TNN the first time, in a better time slot. Yeah. The more I think about this idea, the better it sounds. Doing so would turn the late 11 o'clock time slot into an advantage, as ECW has always been more associated with and oriented toward the more adult audience. Um, that's, there's, there's, there's some truth to that. The plan would also differentiate between the two products in a way that would give the casual fan a reason to watch both shows. Otherwise, I don't see how they would avoid the stigma of the other show becoming just a B-show that nobody would ever want to watch, let alone purchase their pay-per-views. Okay. Uh, okay, we got Max Payne on. Let me just go through. Uh, let's see. How far do you think Brock Lesnar is from TV? I just looked at his picture, and he is a monster. Well, he said himself that uh, he didn't want to be out there for, what do you say, at least eight months to a year, right? Yeah, he said six to eight months. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just go through this really quick. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of these as the show goes on. Um, Max Payne, Daryl Peterson, how are you doing today? Best day ever. Good, good. And then some. <laughs> well, I guess uh, we should talk a little bit about your background for newer fans. Um, you you actually started as a wrestler. Was it Iowa or Iowa State? Um, actually, I started uh, with a junior college called North Idaho Junior College back in, I believe it was 80. And um, was there for two years and then went to Iowa State, yeah, for three was that, years. Did, did you set some sort of records, you know, like break a Chris Taylor record? Or I did, man. Check? That's funny you should ask that, yeah. I, um, it's kind of, it's, a, it's called an unofficial, like, you know, NCAA record, but they still give me a trophy and, you know, a plaque or something. And um, actually, Chris Taylor had uh, an NCAA pin, the record of four pins in 13 minutes and 30 seconds or something like that. And my record was actually um, five pins in um, five minutes and 32 seconds. Is that in the tournament? Is that, yeah, tournament that was, was that in the mean? national tournament. In the national tournament, wow. Yeah. Wow. And and what did you what did you place? Well, you placed fifth. I was, placed fifth that year, but I, you know, it's easy to say when you didn't win it. Uh, you know, we, we, when you hear what I got to say about that, but um, <laughs> I was actually more happier taking fifth because. Um, I got to beat some people that I hadn't beaten, you know, my whole career at Iowa State. And so I just had the tournament of a lifetime, and it was just, you know, it was great to beat, like, this guy from Oklahoma State by the name of Kalen O'Hara. And uh, I stuck him in 32 seconds in the national tournament. And it was, you know, it's one of those things where it, all of a sudden, you know, all the other losses I'd had to him seemed irrelevant. <laughs> you know, and, and he, he, in fact, I remember him cussing me as I was pinning him. He's going, you son of a bitch. He says, I beat you all year long, and you beat me now. <laughs> so that was fun. That was a great, uh, that was a great moment. Now, after that, your pro wrestling, now, did you first get contacted by New Japan? Is that how you got into pro wrestling? No, you know, actually, the way I got into pro was, um, I really didn't go to L.A. I mean, I when I... I've got a I've got an article I'm going to try and put on my website, but um, the, when I, I just never believed I'd be a pro wrestler. I hated it in college because I was so you know pissed off that every time I'd go through an airport and I'd tell somebody 
I was a wrestler, they'd go, oh, we watch you on TV all the time. I said, you've never watched me on TV, all right? You've never watched what I do on television. You know, because they, and they would go, huh? Don't, you're scaring me. But, you know, as an amateur wrestler, you know, nobody watches amateur wrestling on television. You know, it's just one of those things that, not nobody, but the people that are, you know, hardcore fans like myself. I mean, I, I stepped up three o'clock in the morning to watch, you know. Oh, watch ESPN too? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll do that sometimes. I'll be coming home from the studio and, all oh, right, cool, wrestling. But nobody else watches it, you know. So they always would mistake us for whenever we would say wrestling, they'd say pro wrestling. And, you know, we had, there was that huge stigma attached to that, you know. And so, uh, I would never confess to that. So, so, so anyway, how did you first get hooked up with pro wrestling? So then anyway, I moved out to, I moved out to LA and, and, um, was looking for a job, like a real job, because I wanted to go out there and be an actor. That was really what I set forth to do in college, was be an actor and work in television and film. So I moved to, I moved to LA to sort of seek, you know, fame and fortune and, and do all that. And, uh, my first job was as a security guard in, uh, in, in in Los Angeles, and you know when you're a, a, a country kid from even though I've been to college, you know Iowa State's, you know right in the middle. Ames is a small town when school is not in session, you know, and uh, so I just basically lived in the country. You move to L.A. and all of a sudden you're a security guard. Well, my first gig there was um, as a security guard at a punk rock concert at the Olympic Auditorium in downtown. So I'm like scared to death doing that. And then the next gig I had was working at the Palladium for uh, Tate Tillman and Gonzalez. And it just so happened that the owner of the security company had heard I was a wrestler. And when you know, the guy was a Iowa State alumni. And um, he said, hey, I know this guy named Red Bastine. He's a pro wrestling trainer. And, you know, have you ever thought about that? And, you know, I was at a point where in L.A. where I was, you know, ready to go home because I'd been there long enough and my family was suffering enough that I thought, you know, I better go home and get my life back together. And uh, I met Red Bastine that afternoon, and the rest is kind of history. You know, from that point forward, um, I went into his camp. At the time, he tried to get me into the camp that Sting and all the other guys were in, um, but I, I, it was a little too late. So I waited and went through the next camp after that. And uh, one time, you know, towards the end of the camp, Red said, you know, would you be interested in going to Japan? I said, at that point, after I tried it, I, I fell in love with it, you know, because it was it just fit my personality so well to be able to, you know, do a character and and manifest all these things. I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And the Japanese showed up to one of my practices and saw me and signed contracts, and the rest is history. So you went over and uh, basically started. Now, did you start your career in Japan at the, with, the, with the Brian Adams and Chris Benoit? Um, let's clarify that, though. I started my career in Japan with Chris Benoit. Brian came on later, and his lazy butt. He didn't. He didn't do any of the hard stuff. He came on. I <laughs> got out on the easy part. Chris and I had already worked there for nine months and lived in the dojo and got beat up every day and. Brian, being the lucky kind of guy that he is, just happened to fall, you know, right into the best place and position he could fall in in Japan. But Chris and I had actually been there since, you know, like August, just working our guts out, living in the dojo. Brian Adams was lazy. Oh, my God. How can that be? I know that's hard for you to believe. I know this may be a revelation, but Brian... Now now, when you were over there, that was a, a weird time in the in the business in Japan, anyway, because there's yeah. that whole Anoki and Baba just. I don't think they just split, but they they had been split. Yeah, they had been split for a while, but um, Anoki, it's really weird when you you know, especially you got to understand. I didn't grow up a mark, you know. I, I didn't grow up with the business at all. You know, I, I I loved it when I was a kid. I used to watch Rocky Mountain wrestling when I was a kid and couldn't wait to see it, and then. By 10:30 at night was sound asleep, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I used to wait to watch that. But I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't into the wrestling business. I was so devoted to the amateur wrestling business that, you know, I didn't have a background. I didn't know what New Japan was, or you know, I didn't know anything about Inoki. In fact, I just, you know, realized about Inoki when I got there. You know that he'd fought. He was the one that had fought Ali. And uh, well, I, I, what's it like? Okay, you you have this idea, and of course. 
you know, now, a fan now, seeing someone like The Rock or, some, or Steve Austin or something, would kind of have an idea of what Inoki was. But in that day, I mean, there was nobody in the United States that was like Inoki over there. I mean, oh, like no way. Even, and, I, and I, would people, bet, I, I would be surprised even today. No, today it's not, but at least, like, with The Rock, there's a... If I say, like, Inoki is, is, is bigger than The Rock, they can at least kind of fan... Sort you know, of like in their minds. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess I, I guess you probably I, at least equivocal. I mean, the Rock's pretty over, man, isn't it? Yeah, right, right. But but like, no, like I mean, before, at least on the plane for sure. Yeah, yeah but but, before, it, but even but, then, you know, the Japanese culture is different enough that they look at things a little differently. So if once you take that into you know perspective of the whole thing, it, you realize the, the kind of a different. It's a, it's a little different mentality there. Yeah, because I used to like tell people like uh, you know like Inoki was super over, and they would yeah. say like you know Dusty Rhodes or Bruno San Martino, and I go, you don't understand what I'm oh saying. Oh my God, no, you don't have a. You, well, that's what I see. That's a classic example of what I'm talking about. I remember this one night, uh, truly one of those nights to remember in Japan. I have to say, we went out, um, and a lot of times they would just come and get us, you know, and just say Pita, you know, Sakaguchi would come in and go Pita, and he would just you know with a hand signal, say, come here, you know, and we'd know, okay, I guess we're going somewhere, you know. So we'd, we'd go with him, and a lot of times it would be to these incredible places to eat and, and you know, do all kinds of stuff. And uh, so this particular evening, he came and got myself, and this, this evening, uh, Brian Adams um, was with us, and uh, uh, we went to this party, and they fed us like it's just really immaculate. It's a sit down, really traditional Japanese dinner with everybody around the table. And, you know, they realized rather quickly that we didn't like the, you know, the the cuisine of Japan, which is the the, the little obentos and so on and so forth. And and uh, they said, what you know, what do you like? And we said, you know, chicken, shrimp, you know, and, aha. So they bring out these huge plates <laughs> of chicken and shrimp and just are feeding us like crazy and. Then we started drinking, and you know, pretty soon it's just this huge party. And all of a sudden, the the, the host of the party is just drunk enough that he, you know, he stands up and he goes, and he gets really physical. You know, Japanese get really physical when they talk. Oh, Jotomate, you know, and he stands up and you know demands that everybody pay attention because he has something to say, and he tells everybody, and then he he taps his glass again. And this very nice dressed up kabuki um, woman walks in with this huge. Uh, silver domed, you know, like a serving tray thing mm -hmm. with envelopes in them. And uh, he talks about everybody around the table, including us. And she walks around, and every envelope is labeled uh, with names on them. And, you know, I can see what they give everybody, and they bring it to us. And I, I had no idea what it was. I thought it was a card, you know, or something. I had no idea. But I, I just watched what everybody else did, and they just put it in their pocket and didn't say nothing, right? So we get home. And I open it, and it's 300,000 yen. It's like, I don't know, I think that's like 300 bucks or something. It sounds like a, yeah. a billion dollars. It's like 300 or 400 dollars. And I remember seeing the size of a Noki's envelope. And the, the lip of the envelope was in touch, you know. So they would just, they, they would give presents out that were just immense to this guy just because of who he was and who he, who he'd been with. And it went around the table like that. And I've never seen that happen in America. So I don't know. You know. I've <laughs> never a lot of it. things, a lot of things different over there than here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier, and and you know, it's a really professional wrestling is a very strange business, um, very unique business, and a lot the fame and and just the lifestyle is very addictive, which is one of the reasons why you know so many times when guys get older, they say they're going to retire, and and then they never do, and then they keep coming back. And you were mentioning that, you know, like, your retirement was kind of forced on you in that you just stopped getting booked. <laughs> and yeah. and you were talking about, like, that was real, a real tough blow. You know, I don't, I don't think, you know, I mean, I think it's pretty easy for anybody to understand what it feels like when you feel, you think, you know, you're a part of something and have that whole thing turn its back on you. At least you feel that way, you know what I mean? Your perceptions that way, I think no matter who you are, that's going to, that's going to smack you around pretty hard. Especially when you devoted 11 years of your life to trying to be better at it and, you know, do things that maybe nobody else had tried to do before. 
And so it was it was really hard on me when the business went away. I I laid around for six months, really confused, um, partly because I personally was so addicted to painkillers and Valiums and everything else that, um, you know, I, I just, it, it was, it was all at once, what kind of thing too. It was cold turkey all at once and, uh, it was difficult. And then it sort of went away and I actually made the mistake of trying to go back into the business for three months. I went back to Europe and, uh, I just, I walked out in the middle of it because I just, I couldn't take it no more. I, I was, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't go back to the lifestyle. Um, and for me, I just, it didn't work. And I realized at that time I was done. You know, I really said, that's it. You accomplished what you wanted to accomplish was, which was allow yourself an opportunity to go on to something else that was more career oriented. Um, you're not going to be, you know, 25 the rest of your life. You know, I, somehow I saw the sun shine through all that. And I think the way I found the sunshine was through my family. You know, they just never gave up on me and was there with me through thick and thin. And that's how I made it through. But uh, it was tough. It was as tough as any addiction that you could ever imagine to try and kick. It's a weird, it's a weird thing because now, I mean, based on what you told me earlier, it was probably the best thing that ever happened in your life. But when it happened, it was oh, at it was that moment crushing. probably the, the the worst thing, right? It was crushing, man. It, you know, you just, especially when, you know, I really, I really tried very hard, and, I, and maybe I don't, I, I, I really don't know. I don't know what I did wrong. To this day, I wished I had an answer. I wished I could say to you, you know, because I, I made some mistakes. There's no question about it. I would never sit here and you know deny that I was a, you know, I was a retard. I made all kinds of mistakes that. Anybody, anybody does go into the show for the first time, I think. I think everybody, you know, not necessarily everybody, but, you know, there's been a lot of people that have done that. And I stepped back and, and said, okay, what do I got to do to change? But for some reason, I didn't get a second chance at all. You know, I could never get anybody to return a phone call and tell me what was going on. And so... Um, by that time, I was so I, I wasn't necessarily bitter. I was just turned off, and honestly, by that point in time, my focus of direction. By the time I'd moved back from Atlanta and moved home, and sort of already started, you know, the discharge from the business. I guess it was already sort of laid down that I was going to quit and and go away. And when you walked what? away, I mean, was it like you didn't talk to anybody anymore? Did you just uh, I have a couple no desire friends. for independent bookings or anything like that? No, I, I didn't consider anything. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't. I just took my boots off because the, the reality of it is, you know, I told Vince from the very beginning that I didn't. I, I wasn't a wrestler. I really didn't want to be a wrestler in the WWF. I really wanted to be a talent. I really wanted to be somebody that, you know, that was an idea guy and brought forth, you know. You know things to the business that were outside the ring because I honestly never, never felt I was a very good wrestler. You know, I I just I, I loved the business, I loved the premise of the business and the fundamental you know part of the business that's the you know the sort of classic theater mentality. It's if you scrape away all the stuff down underneath, all of the exterior parts of the business is this beautiful nugget of Greek tragedy. You know, that was the part I really dug. But actually being in the ring was not the part that I felt was my best asset. You know, I, I much, I, I wanted to, to be a musician in the WWF and a character like Jesse, you know, who interviewed and, you know, brought special segments and the boys could do videos with and we, you know, it was just kind of that guy, you know. Mm -hmm. But for some reason I could never get through, you know, to the, to the office, to, especially to Vince. You know, that that's what I wanted to do. And for some reason, I don't know if Vince and I just didn't hit it off from the beginning or what. I, I thought we did. I, like I said, I, to this day, the hard part for me is I still, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what happened. I mean, did you talk to him about, um, you know, working behind the scenes with the music? Or was oh, it more yeah. like... Oh, yeah, from the beginning. Uh -huh. You know, from the beginning, doing producing things and, you know, wasn't producing there, wasn't, videos wasn't... and... Was there ever a talk, because I, I mean, I don't know if that was with you, but I remember there was talk at one point that they would actually have like a, a, a WF band, which would be like wrestlers. Yeah. 
And and I think that for whatever reason it never were you involved in that and then it never yeah. got going for some reason. Yeah, you know well. Wait, let's. Uh, is that the line of direction of questioning you want to go in? Because that's a long story. You know that well, starts way back in sure. WCW days with Brian, and you know that goes way way back. So mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you want to head down that road, well, let's head yeah, down. Yeah, sure, let's go. Well, you know, like I said, I, I from the day it's really funny. Let me let me just start this whole thing out with the interesting thing about what I I always found was a problem was no matter what promoter. I put my gimmick in front of them. They all told me, no, I couldn't do it, even Vince. And I never understood that. I never understood why they, they couldn't just let me be me. You know, they always wanted to control some part of it. The Japanese told me, no, I couldn't be Max Payne. And I said, well, I'm going to be Max Payne. That's my character. That's what I And they said, no, <laughs> you're not going to be Max Payne. I come home to Memphis. Think, you know, I take that back. Let me give Lawler some enough credit here. Because Lawler took it way over the edge and took it into a darkness that, I, in, in some ways, I really enjoyed it. I didn't like the Satan ties, but I at least enjoyed the darkness side of it. You know what I mean? Um, but every promoter I ever worked with, you know, told me, you know, no, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And, you know, I always wanted to be a musician, and, and somehow it struck me when I was in Japan that that was sort of the liaison a heavy metal wrestler that actually came to the ring playing and then did music and, you know, all this other stuff on the side. And so I just started working on that. You know, I, I always wanted to play the guitar. It gave me good reason to carry a guitar around with me and practice all the time. You know, it gave me good reason to, to really be the gimmick that I wanted to be. Um, but at Memphis time, after shortly after Japan, I still, you know, I wasn't ready yet. I still hadn't practiced and felt, you know, had felt comfortable enough about it. And um, so then I went to Europe. I uh, did my own little wrestling organization for a while. Went to Europe, and midway through Europe, this thing was just dwelling on me so hard. I actually met a record executive at the time, too, who was an American living in Germany. And I told him I wanted to do this, and he said, well, then there's only one thing for you to do. Just go home and work your guts out between the tours. I was in Germany for two seasons with Otto Wands. So I came home. It was right after Metallica's Black Album had came out. And I came home, and I just practiced like 20 hours a day for five months nonstop, just everything I could think of. And I went back to Europe, and Otto would not let me do this gimmick. Oh, I could bet. He yeah. told me I was <laughs> such an idiot. He actually called me an idiot. <laughs> and finally we got to Hanover, and Peter Williams said to me, he said, you know, I went to him, and I said, Peter, you know, let me try. Let me just try it. What do we got to lose? Let's try this because, God, in Hanover there were like, you know, 13 people there on a Monday <laughs> night, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, what do we got to lose? Or we certainly, if we run these 12 off, you know, six more drunks will show up abstractly just for no reason, you know. <laughs> so um, anyway, he finally I talked him into it. And he was much more theatrical oriented in terms of his wrestling program. He, he controlled Hanover. Otto had nothing to do with Hanover. And I was practicing one day, Fit Finley. Man, God bless Fit Finley. Fit, I, if you're listening and you hear this, please send me an email um, because I, I love Fit Finley. God, he's such a stud. You know, we I was playing and Tony St. Clair walked in. He said, I am begging you to shut that shit off. <laughs> and I'm going, what? He goes, that sucks. Don't do that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm doing it, Tony. And he walked out all disgusted. And when, <laughs> when he walked out the door, Fit goes, uh, can I, so I, can I can I say anything or what? Yeah. I can say the F word. Sure. Or do you prefer not to have that on the air? I would prefer not to. Okay, then do it if you want to. I won't stop you. You're too big for me. No, I'm not going to. Because I would rather not cuss. But you get okay. the drift. He basically said, you know, Max, just don't worry about Tony. He can go blank himself, you know, on Main Street, and uh, and just keep doing your gimmick. And so I did the gimmick, and the first night I did it, there was 20 people there. And then they advertised it. The next time I did it, there was 80 people there. The next time I did it, there was 200 people there. It's better than the XFL now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so by the end of the whole thing, um, we were packing the tent in Hanover. It was truly uh, unbelievable. Um, Dave Taylor and uh, you know, Lord Stephen turned me babyface. I was a heel up till then, completely a heel. 
But then I started playing every night and doing this playing thing, and the crowd just ate it up. And I became heavy metal Buffalo when they turned me babyface, and and uh, we sold out all the heavy know. metal Buffalo. Oh yeah, it is that ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. They That's wanted they gimmick. actually wanted me to do that in the WWF, and I said I said to uh, who was it? It what? was. Uh, Heavy metal buffalo? Uh, yeah, they, he actually goes. He goes. God, that's uh, JJ. Goes. God, that's cool. I go. Don't even think about it, JJ. I am not doing heavy metal buffalo in the World <laughs> Wrestling Federation. <laughs> no you end up in the gimmick way. battle royal on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it all started there. I started playing, um, and Bill Watts saw it, and I sent him a tape. And Bill Rip, Watts. Yep. Rip Rogers. <laughs> oh my God. Saw you know saw my matches. Bill Watts and I had already talked actually once before. He liked the amateur background thing. Sure, but yeah, he I'm dug. Kidding. Man, believe it or not, he dug the guitar thought process. Mm. And um, so from that day forward, once I got into the WCW, is Max Payne. You know, they did the Norma Jean's Blues thing. I did a music video right at the very first, and you know, Dusty tried, but Dusty just you know, Bill left. Dusty tried, and nobody ever gave a crap, and you know they. That was sort of the size of it. So, yeah, the band thing all started back that long ago. And from that moment forward, once I got out of the WCW, you know, from the time I met with Vince, my goal was merely to be the support structure for Brian, you know, to be the musical, the band background, the Monday Night Raw mentality. I would love to have been a Monday Night Raw band, you know, or whatever. They tried um, that with Michael Hayes once. Yeah. The Raw band. Remember that for a little while? Did they? Yeah. Yeah, well, I never even got it. I never even got an opportunity to try. So I did one time, and uh, it was absolutely the worst night of my life. Dave actually made intense fun of me that night. <laughs> the night with Bob Backlund. Oh God! Absolutely the worst. You, you know, you can't. I mean, how, whatever you wrote about me in that one, Dave. You know, you know, thumbs up to you because I felt fifty times worse than you wrote about me. I guarantee mm -hmm. you. You know, first of all, they put me on with, first of all, they put me in the Madison Square bar Garden with a PA system out of a bar. I'm, I've got a monitor system from a bar with a guy who runs it in the bar. I'm like, this is Madison Square Garden and you want me to play with the system you use in a bar from 20 feet away? It was really the worst equipment I'd ever seen in my life. And, I, you know, I, I, inside me, everything in my, Bones was raging. Don't do this. You know. Then they wanted me to job for Bob, and I didn't mind that. That part of the business doesn't bug me at all. But just the whole music thing was so wrong. You know, I really wanted to just say no. And I begged Vince after that show. I said, Vince, I'm begging you. If we're going to do this, please, it has to be done. You know, by pros. You know, by the top AV people in the world, or it's going to fail and fail horribly. And um, I guess it rest sort of speaks for itself, mm. you know. In WCW, I guess you're, I, I don't know if you, if you consider these your most memorable matches, but I think most people consider your most memorable matches with the Cactus Jack against the Nasty Boys. Um, when we were doing that, that program, it was like, a, I guess it would be like what hardcore wrestling is now, but then it was actually um, kind of a novelty, especially on pay-per-view, uh, the matches that you guys had. And, um what, what, you know, was that was that the was that the, the highlight of your career, or what would you consider the highlight of your career? Well, I kind of have mixed emotions about the the nasty thing because I, you know, I learned a lot from them in the sense of how to be an asshole, you know, <laughs> because if you're not with them, they will just, you know, take such hardcore advantage of you. That you know, if you don't protect yourself, they they're, they're not they're so, they don't care whether they hurt you or not. Um, so, from one sense, I got beat up probably worse than I ever did because they were just such horribly sloppy wrestlers that they would just hurt you and you know, and, oh, was that stiff, brother? Uh, well, the fact that I have no teeth now, you know, should probably indicate that you may have been just a little stiff on the knee, big boy. Um, but no, there were there were several times that they rendered me unconscious, dropping knees on my forehead and smashed me into the turn posts and you know cut my. I actually lost the feeling in the whole entire side of my face one night after working with them because they they trapped my arms and ran my head into the post. Looking back in retrospect, 
I'm absolutely convinced that was intentional, you know, I mean, but, you know, at some point you still hope that people have enough respect to protect you, and the nasty boys, you always wondered about them. But we sure had some moments, you know, I have to say, in terms of whether they were the sort of pinnacle of my career, I guess I don't really have much of a choice but to say yes, because, you know, it was really the last big thing and the only big thing, you know, and not the only, I I think the Johnny B. Bad thing was something, but, um, they were certainly the highlight of my career in between WCW and WWF, that's for sure. Um, the, I have you, real mixed emotions about that. Really now, now, what, explain, I mean, now, the, I remember, this is really vague, but you, you, you and Cat Jack were a team, and then, I don't know if this, this affected him, and I don't know if it affected you, but there was a segment on a television show, and I don't even remember the show anymore, where they were talking about Missy Hyatt's lawsuit, and yeah. I think they came up to both of I you. I was there on that one. Okay. That was and, after that match, actually. You know, okay. it, it was that, that was actually after the match. You know, we were walking back to the, you know, Super 8 motel that's across the parking lot or the Hotel 6. I don't know. It's one of the cheap ones. Across the parking lot from the United Center. And, of course, he and I, you know, trying to save money. We certainly didn't, you know, drive there. We, he, he can, he assured me that it was much easier just to walk there than try to drive the car there and, you know, I realized how nice it would have been to sit in a car after the match with the Nasty Boys, you know, to get back to the hotel. But we're walking out of the uh, arena. That, you know, before we go, before we go to there, I think I have to, I have to precede this with something because there was a moment in that match that evening that I'm sure that we all felt that I'm not sure even the audience realized, and I, I felt it was a precedent-setting moment for me. I was absolutely probably the biggest night of my life um and especially after i saw the movie gladiator just you know recently there was a moment in that match where the audience was so prepared to accept death that it just scared the ever-loving crap right out of me and i don't know if you know what i mean by that i'm not trying to be you know real dark here but or whatever you want to say but there was a moment where things were getting, you know, crazy enough that the crowd, you know, would have easily accepted, you know, a gladiator type moment there. And everybody would have been abhorred, but by the same token, everybody would have watched it happen. And it was one of those moments where I went, this is, this is a little bit over the edge, you know. And, uh, I walked away with there, from there with some very mixed feelings about, about the match. And I know Cactus did because I watched him cut, co- cough up part of his, you know, lung and God knows what other, you know, parts of uh, his internal organs was in, you know, what he coughed up. But um, when we walked out of there, I certainly wasn't feeling like I was on cloud nine, even though nobody ever set down that whole match, you know. And, uh, and then he did the interview with Missy, and he and I had had a lot of conversations, you know, up till then. Um, and I, it, it was <laughs> it was an interesting moment. I, I wish I could find the exact words to describe how I felt, how he felt um, when we went back to the hotel. But we sat there for a while and didn't say much. You know, um, like I said, it was an interesting it was an interesting night, all in all. And Cactus actually said, "Yeah, I hope Missy gets a bunch of money out of Ted." And <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> got a that was got a bunch of press over that. I'm in the back. <laughs> oh, that going, was Cactus. Shut up. Shut that up. was the beginning of the end for him in that company. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It didn't help me much either. I know. <laughs> I know probably it would have been a lot, uh, a lot better for your career to actually work with Cactus instead of teaming with him. But what did you? Uh... I, I wouldn't have wanted to do that either. I worked with him, and we we were the wrong people to put together as oppositions. We really were. It was much better as a tag team. The the office, you know, the office was just scared of our tag team. They really were. I had Bill. I remember Bill Dundee said, I don't get it. I don't get how oh, two fat, ugly sons of bitches like you can get over. And I'm like, dude, why does that just abhor you so much? Bro? You know, Twinkie eaters need a hero. People who eat pizza and watch wrestling, you know, they need a hero because, you know, they don't, not all of them look like The Rock, you know, or Stone Cold. You know, there's got to be the fat guy identification thing out there somewhere, you know. And uh, it just killed him that, that fat guys could get over. Mm-hmm. You know what was it between the two of you that didn't work out as far as having matches? Um, I didn't enjoy. You know, I I just I don't know what it was. 
I mean, we had a couple matches in England, and they were okay, but they were nothing to write home to mom about. And it was just one of those things where I, I much preferred the shtick we did as partners, you know? Mm-hmm. I much preferred the interviews as partners, you know? I, I think it was kind of a, you know, a nice um, sort of scenario. It was a nice balance with with Mick and I. And um, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed my time with Mick, I have to say. I really did. Now, the last tour that you were with the WWF, you brought your video camera. And uh, what's the story on all that? Well, for some reason, I, you know, I really, I'm really not quite sure what the reason I took my video camera with me was. I, I, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. And um, for some reason, I, the, I, I didn't know it was my last tour. So looking back in retrospect, you know, it, it even seems more miraculous that I took the dang thing with me because I certainly, and after you see the whole movie, I, and you see what, I mean, you actually already hear sort of what I say towards the end of the movie anyway, which is, oh, yeah, I'm going to be doing this again tomorrow. And, you know, that was it. The, the last thing I said on the videotape was, oh, yeah, I can't wait to go to work tomorrow, basically, and I was done. So, you know, it, it was, it was, it was really a, a tough, uh, a tough moment in time because here I am thinking that things are going great and I've got this movie into my, in my back pocket now. So I take my video camera and do this, this movie on this last tour and I don't know why I took it. Don't know why I shot it. it certainly wasn't easy, you know, doing what I did. Um, but, I sort of read, it's funny because I didn't even realize I had it till, uh, almost a year and a half ago and I, you know, I, I knew I had it but I never really sat down and looked at it. Um, but I realized how complete it was and it's, it's got some incredible things on it. Some, I think anyway, I think there's some, some moments that no wrestling fan has ever seen and knowing the wrestling business, I'm sure that Vince would never, you know, show you the moments the way I've showed them just simply because uh, it takes away a little bit from the control factor, but um, this is just a moment with basically a guy that took his camera on the road, and it was amazing how candid everybody was. You know, nobody uh, nobody even hesitated a second um, being candid on camera and, and and being themselves. And so, it really, I think it's a, an, a very interesting piece of film. And so. Um, I shot this this movie, and anybody who wants to um, see a trailer of it, you can go to my website at uh, maxpain.com, and there's three levels of download there, and you can see the preview to the thing that should not be, which is um, a three and a half hour, I, I, an hour and a half is probably what it'll end up being, an hour and a half movie of um, life on a road with a wrestler, and. Uh, a wrestler who didn't make it, <laughs> who tried desperately to to make it and thought he was making it, and by the crowd's response, you'd hope that he'd make it, but for whatever reason, I didn't make it. So that's what turned out. How close do you fall wrestling these days? Uh, the, the closest, you know, I I got a couple friends still in the bit. Well, I should say one friend that contacts me. You know, we stay in, in contact. Um, I, I don't know much about it. I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, I, I know who the stars are. I, I know what the people that I care about that, you know, I still feel like I have some contact with. Um, I know what they're doing. I pay enough attention to, to, you know, know what they're doing. Um, but you know, not, not, I'm certainly not an intent, partly because I don't have the time. You know, I, I actually do kind of enjoy watching it and, and seeing people like Chris you know, finally arise to the top and, and so on and so forth. But uh, I don't I don't watch wrestling very much. Now, you know, as someone who was in wrestling, and, and, and wrestling has changed, and you haven't been out of it that long, yet it's an entirely different business oh, in yeah. many ways. Um, you know, I mean, like just we talked about, you know, Peter William and, and Otto Vance. I mean, they basically, you know, that, that CWA doesn't exist. Yep. Um, WCW doesn't exist. Oh, um, God. You know, I mean, I mean, it's like, what... 
You know, I mean, it, it's it's really turned into a very. I mean, I mean, what are your thoughts as far as if you were a wrestler or just knowing what you know about wrestling? The idea that, as, as certainly in North America, it's it's a one man show right now. Well, I, I think you, I think you may underestimate the power of Vince there almost a little bit in the sense that, you know, really, when you look at the World Wrestling Federation and you look at what the business is. Um, you know, we're talking about a business who has claims great power worldwide. I would almost suggest to anybody listening, I mean, think about the reality of it all, is what would the NFL do in India and what does the WWF do in India? You know, there's, there's certainly, you can certainly go, you know, they're going to draw an audience in India because they got, if they've got television there, people will come and see them. And, and so, and it goes that way around the world. I mean, they'll sell out shows. Especially when the business is good, I don't know how they're doing right now in Europe, but I would, I would. They, they they would do well, but they don't even have to go because their business is so strong here. Still now. good at home, exactly my point. So yeah. now you got the rest of the world watching his TV and hungry. You might have to question whether you know he's not bigger worldwide than anything that uh, uh, anything else that America has to offer. And I would say, you know, this is where I'm going to go out on the limb. And Vince is, I'm sure, if he should ever hear me say this would you know cringe at the thought of this but i would say the timing couldn't be more perfect um what needs to happen in the business i thought it i thought it then i think it now i think the boys need representation um i think i believe i've always believed in a union partly because i came from a union family and i saw how the union protected my father in the steel mill um and looked after my family so from a union standpoint i'm certainly you know i think i think union um, I'm not sure a classic union would work in the wrestling business. I'm not sure it's the perfect answer, but I sure think that I sure think N- that nothing's perfect. There's flaws oh, in every system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you, nothing's perfect, but I sure think I I think and and you know what? I'm going to go even go out on a further limb. I think AFTRA and what part of the Screen Actors Guild you know could protect the boys if wrestling is entertainment. I almost have to say to the to the unions of the television and performers, shame on you for not, you know, protecting those who can't protect themselves. And I'm I'm certainly not talking about the top guys in the WWF, you know, as in any other sport. When you form a union, you look out to protect the guys who are the supporting cast that, you know, give you an hour and 25 minutes before you come out and are the star, you know. And and so I think the union concept is a concept that I. I pitch just simply for, from, a, and, and I've always pitched it, and quite frankly, it's probably one of the reasons that I'm blackballed in the wrestling business. But I, I really believe that a union and is a must. And the sad part is, none of the boys will do it because by the time somebody says, "Hey, let's start a union," and they all go, "Yeah," by the time you get to the door, there, there won't be anybody behind. There's one guy. Yeah, there'll be one guy <laughs> standing there going, and Hulk Vince, Hogan we want to do off. a union." <laughs> and Hulk so Hogan it's going to take a guy you. like me who's not in the business anymore to say, "Hey, Vince." I challenge you to expose the salaries of, and Rock, I'm doing you a favor right now, and, and uh, Stone Cold, because I'm convinced after I do this interview, I'll never go back to the business anyway. So, you know, I mean, I, I've been quiet up till now, not really. You know, I, I say I challenge you, Vince, to show your salaries with in comparison to the other great athletes in the United States. And, well, you know, compared to baseball players, I just Josh those Jake baseball just, salaries last I night on ESPN. That was pretty scary. There's not one guy on the on the list from the WWF. Why oh, the top like of the top probably hundred athletes? I bet if there's no, no, not not because there's so many baseball players that make so ungodly amount of money. But here's the thing, though, you got to ask yourself. It's I mean, think about baseball. How many baseball players are there in the United States? I mean, now pro- Vince pro- just went it down to where there's six, twenty seven, guys right? in the wrestling world making money. <laughs> you know, well, well, there's a little more than twenty, but there's less than a hundred. But I mean, the real, the real, real money. Yeah, real money, to, top players. I mean, I mean, if you're talking about a million dollars, there's there's a handful. That's exactly my point. And don't there's, you there's, think that, I think that's a little ironic, considering these guys are doing 300 days a year on the road. They work harder than anybody else, or filling houses all over the United States, and yet they're not in the top hundred of. of paid oh, well, for the revenue for the revenue they generate is compared to golfers, that's, baseball that's, players, that's football all players. They're not they're not even in the not same even league. In the ballpark, brother. For the revenue they generate, yeah, we talk about that all the time, like. You know, football players, basketball players will get like you know fifty percent of the revenue of that sport, and wrestlers get like twelve percent. So I so challenge the president of AFTRA, to, you know, to say, "Hey, what's going on here? These guys need protection." That's the bottom line. Somebody, 
somebody needs to look after him and somebody that's smart to the business and can't be shoved around by Vince. And uh, let's head to the phone calls. We're going to start with Charles. Charles, how are you tonight? Hey, how you doing, Dave? Uh, Matt, doing very Ryan. Good. Hey. Max, I, I actually enjoyed your character in WCW. I liked the painkiller. I thought it was Thanks, man. pretty over submission. And uh, I, I disagree with you. I, I would like to have seen you and Cactus uh, work, you and Mick work a program. It may have been, you know what? It may have been good. I, I, I certainly, I just know I had so much fun with him as a, as a partner that, you know what? It, I, 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 you're probably right. Anything could have gone between Mick and I. As, there's no question about it. Yeah, it would have been fun. And I, like I said, I really enjoyed your, your transition into that painkiller. It, see, it it looked like it was killing the guy, and I guess it was a pretty safe move. So to, to you know, was, I got to I'll tell you a funny condition. story about that. One night we were in Alabama, and uh, I was working. They, they put me out against a job guy. And if this kid's listening, I, I I'll apologize to him again before I tell his story. <laughs> we uh, you know he come in and uh, you know they they brought him in the room. We were talking about you know the finish and stuff. And he, I said, okay, I'm going to do the painkiller. And he. I said, no problem, and he kind of looked at me a little funny. He said, yeah, no problem, we'll do it, right? So we went out, and um, we did something else prior to the painkiller. I don't remember exactly what it was, some kind of a, a slam or a tackle. And when he lit, he he lit on his shoulder funny. Oh he took goodness. a bad bump, and I think he was trying to do a 360 or something. And he took a bad bump and lit on his shoulder and dislocated his shoulder. Oh, my God. But he didn't smart me up to the fact that he'd hurt himself. So I, pull, I put him in a painkiller and reset it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and we got out of the ring, man. I felt so bad. He goes, dude, my shoulder was dislocated. I said, well, why didn't you tell me I had to throw you out of the ring or something, you know? Because, bam, I put him in the painkiller. But, hey, I saved him the money. You know, yeah, saved move, him the money the going to the doctor. So the move he, actually, he had a chiropractic yeah. properties as well. That's Outstanding. it. Hey, Dave. Um, yes. I get, well, let me run, run a few things by you on this uh, WCW, WWF thing. The, um, I, I think they started it off smart by, you know, the McMahons are kind of the stars of, of their company, so uh, pitting Vince against Shane and turning WCW face, I think that was a good move. But um, as far as the TV spots that they're considering, I don't know. The more I think about it, I just I don't see it being able to work unless you really continue to build this thing up as something major that, that – at some point is going to lead to Shane taking over SmackDown and maybe getting The Rock or something. Otherwise, it's not going it, to, it, it's not a consistent gimmick, you know what I mean? Oh, no, they need to, the problem is, is that you need two relatively equal in power sides to have exactly. a good feud. Exactly. And right now, right now, the 24 guys that they have signed from WCW, I mean, the biggest stars are, are Lance Storm and Mike Awesome. That's not enough star power. So they got to send guys, and they can't send Billy Gunn and Test and think that that's the answer because then that's that they don't, that only make it worse. Well, they, they got to have they got to have. I mean, The Rock or Triple H, one of those two's got to be there, or you're really going to have problems. I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. With without, I think Jericho's the, uh, all right. No, 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 I mean, he's not. There's nothing wrong with sending Jericho, but he can't be the number one guy either. Yeah, yeah you, you probably should send the radicals back in because they have an association with the company, but you, you, you ultimately are going to have to send one of your top guys. It would have to either be, I, I would have said Hunter and the entire clique before this latest Shawn Michaels incident, but now I'm leaning towards probably The Rock being the guy that you got to send. I think from a scheduling standpoint, The Rock is, the rock is better. The thing, the thing I, why, I mean, there's nothing wrong with sending Benoit and some of those guys. I would almost rather not send the guys that were there before because then it just looks sort of like, you know what I mean? It's like they've already been there. They've already wrestled a lot of those guys. So you know, nothing you want... unique about it. Yeah, I, I would rather elevate those guys within the WF structure and send guys over there that have never been there before. So at least that way you have some, you know, a unique uh, environment for them. And plus, it, the one thing is, if the Rock is there, that's their best shot at doing ratings from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. If they send, you know, say just Benoit or somebody like that, you know, the average WF fan isn't going to watch another show. If it becomes SmackDown, or I mean not SmackDown, but it becomes like Heat or Jacked or something like that, and, and the Heat ratings, the Heat ratings right now in prime time, are are not exactly. very good, and and I mean that's the there's, there's your answer right there is Heat is is doing you know between a one one five and a two you know one six to a two generally most weeks, uh, I think they did a two two a week ago, but but I mean in that range, and for this thing to be successful, it's got to do you know better than that in, in a worse time slot, so you've got to have more star power than you got on Heat. And, well, I'm, th and I'm thinking you're gonna. I'm, I'm thinking in order for it to work, David, it, it's gonna have to be the second show. They're gonna have to. They're gonna have to give them a WCW SmackDown. 
And that's I don't, not going to happen think right. That's not going to happen right away. You mean a second WCW show or no, have not, SmackDown turn into? No, no, no. Have WCW SmackDown show. become? Has SmackDown become WCW? Exactly. As part of the story. Oh, ultimately, line. ultimately, Shane you're right, Charles. The SmackDown show. If they do some gimmick where in September one side, yeah, they get SmackDown. Uh, then you then you have a real chance at a money feud at that point. And because, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, then they're, then they're like they have equal team TV. Yeah, I'm thinking it's going to be best for the writers too, because then you can just concentrate on the two major shows, and it looks like an equal feud at that point. And yeah. I'm thinking storyline wise, it even has to get to the point where it's going to look like WCW may win, and then you'd have to introduce the third element to to turn on Shane, forcing Shane to side back with the WWF, thus turning the main company face again. You know the other thing about what you said, which actually I'm really I really like that idea, which and you can't do it right away, but at some point it also I think will help each individual show. It'll help Raw because all of a sudden those other guys, you can only see them once a week. One of the problems I think that there is now is that you got that you see everyone twice a week. So you know if you miss, you know it, it makes it more easy to miss a show right now. I, I agree. Plus there's so many replays, you can miss a show. And not only yeah. that, I, th I think you're you're looking at a problem of. Uh, tremendous overexposure of the product because if you think about it now, even though it is less wrestling to watch a week per se, it's more of the exact same product. Though. It's more of the same wrestling, so that's right. So it's, it's it's overexposure of the product, not the product wrestling, but the product WWF. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I'm, I'm thinking uh, ultimately it's going to have to come down to between those two shows. You know, WWF keeps Raw and Shane somehow finagles his father out of the SmackDown contract, and he takes over, you know, makes the WCW SmackDown, and, and he gets the Rock contract or something like that. And in fact, you're almost going to have to do that if the WCW superstars are going to sit this thing out. Yeah, which but WCW is, gets Raw. Oh, either way. That would be interesting. There's nothing I wrong with that. Even makes the same premise. I mean, yeah. SmackDown, I think that overall the rating is probably a little higher for SmackDown, and it's the, uh, you know, it's the broadcast show. But, w, you know, Raw has the name. You know, that's been the show since day one or whatever, since the war started. So give them that one. It would be viewed as a bigger coup to take Raw in the story. Yeah, and it really wouldn't be. Yeah. But to the fans, it would be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is going to yeah, make the story true. more interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. Um, uh, Dave, has there been any more word of where any of the top guys like Flair and some of the others stand on this thing? Uh, Flair's looking... Flair's got... Um... Two years left on a contract that pays eight hundred thousand a year, mm. and that is a lot to turn away. I would say, um, you know, and I, I'll, I'm sure I'll know more about this one certainly by Monday. Uh, but I think that the odds of Flair going there are less than fifty percent. I can tell you right now they're way less than fifty percent. I mean, they may, you know, again, if Vince wants anybody bad enough, yeah, he's going to get them. Yeah. It's just a question of how bad he wants them. But um, you know, the uh, you know. Flair going there, from from what I understand the facts to be, uh, the odds are a lot less than I thought they were yesterday. Put it that way. Dave, you're, you're Vince McMahon. Uh, who's the key guy that you really go after? I'm never going to be Vince McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> well, just never hypothetically have. speaking, who, who's the key guy that you go after to break this whole thing open but and kind of make everybody you, you, else? You, I mean, you certainly got to make a hell of an offer for Goldberg because it's the match the fans so. want. I, I mean, we so. hear it all week. Every you know, the emails I get is Steve Austin, Bill Goldberg is what everybody is the match that everybody wants, and that's why to me putting Gilberg in the battle royal or mentioning Bill Goldberg on TV, unless you're going to get him, you don't want everyone dreaming for this one match. We can't wait for this match that you're not going to deliver. It's totally counterproductive. Yeah. Well, How I, does this I, whole contract thing work as far as uh, you know? What does Turner have? Do they have the ability to keep him off even sitting in the front row? Is it just wrestling? What is it? Well, I mean, theoretically, exclusive. I mean, the whole thing is, is that the, the, you know, you're not, you can't put someone on there when they have an existing contract with someone else, and uh, you know, Turner, you know, these guys would rather sit and collect their Turner money because it's guaranteed by or Time Warner money, as opposed to going on the road, make and, and you know, yeah, you're going on the road and making less money. That makes no sense mm -hmm. than to sit at home and, and collect it. There are, you know, there are those ten guys, whoever they are. Um, but those are the ten top guys for the you know not quite ten top guys but for the most part they're the the, the top one. The thing with the guys. WWF though is you have to factor in like uh, the mainstream exposure. I mean, if Rock were making a million dollars in WCW, let's just say he was a WCW guy and this whole thing happened and he was making say two million dollars a year, and it was up to him to decide whether he was going to go to WWF for like a four hundred thousand dollar get downside or keep his two million dollars a year. I mean, what he's gotten in WCW is, or WWF is, he's become a huge star. He's got movie deals, a book that just did huge. And, you know, can Goldberg get that? Can he get a movie deal? Can he get, like, a, a book deal? 
I mean, it's, he's probably, booked it okay. He, he's, he's, already, he's, already, he's already done the book. The um, the movies, you know, he'll either get it or, you know, he won't. But, yeah, you're right. There, there's there's upsides. There's upsides to going. But the difference between $2 million a year and 400000 a year, I don't know if that's and, – and, and then you're risking that you're going to make another million six plus you're going to be out on the road all those days as opposed to not being on the road. I mean, they're all factors to take into consideration. Well, I tell you this, the WWF promotional vehicle is still very strong, so that there is potential for those guys to recoup a lot of that money. And, you know, the, the fact yeah, of you know, your, your, your face not being on TV for a while, does that drive your value up or bring it down? We don't know because we don't know what the marketplace is going to be. Three years from now, it may drive your value up because they're going to need somebody big, and there you are out there as a free agent, or the business may be through the roof and everyone may have just forgotten who you were. Although, you know what, guys? I guess Darryl, what he would have done. What? Yeah, Dar yeah. What's that? Yeah. What, 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 in a situation, so let's, let's put you in the Bill Goldberg situation, okay? Yeah. You got basically two and a half years, at, let's say two and a half million a year, to sit at home, or you have a chance to go to the WWF with no, let's just say your, your guarantee is a half a million a year, but, uh, you know, you can make it up theoretically. I mean, if you're in the main event at WrestleMania, you might even be able to make the, the same amount of money, but you're going on the road, you know, you're 200, 250 days a year. Um, what's, you know, what, what, what would you want and what would you be thinking as far as making that decision? Well, you know, I'm probably not the perfect guy to ask that in the sense that for me, it's an easy decision. I'd stay home with my family. I mean, you know, okay. I mean, if you're guaranteed that kind of money at some point, I mean, I, I'm, that's a lot of money, you know, it's a lot of money and not have to do anything. I mean, if. He's obviously been content to be off the air right now. How long has he been off right now? Uh, when were the agreed was off in January. They did the loser, le or the, uh, the loser must retire match. I mean, January. everybody wants off. to see it. There's no question about it. Um, will it still be alive in two and a half years? Yeah, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, if you, he just took the money and sat at home for two and a half years, is that, what you're, is that the question? The question yeah. is, do you take the money, or do you go back on the road, or do you go on the road and nah, figure geez, that, like... Not even, I mean, the road's hard. And if you yeah. get two and a half million for sitting at home, you know, buy a case of, uh, you know, Jolly Time and hang down and watch movies and watch your kids grow up for, you know, for two and a half years and enjoy life. Yeah, plus because the other thing is... You're still going to be around, you'll be healthy, you know, you work out every day, you'll, you know, everything will be great. So I would, I would just say, stay home and take the money. Dave, I, I just have two more things. Um, does Turner Time Warner have any type of negotiation leverage at all? On these contracts, or are they just set in stone? In in what sense? You mean, I mean, as far as not, like not paying them? Yeah, or, or getting them to uh, renegotiate the contract and settle. Well, they can they can they can try to buy them out, but the other guy has to agree to it. Or they can you know try to find a breach somewhere. But you know, I mean, these guys. I tell you what, in that situation, what can they be breaching right now? Well, well they better try not to, being at home. They, well, let me ask you this: Can can they, since since technically they're still employees, can they say, well, if we're going to pay you, you guys have to come do some type of work for us? No, they, they, only if it's only if it's wrestling, because they're wrestling contracts, not employee yeah. contracts. Hmm. So yeah, if they were to open up a wrestling company, they could, if they, but which they can't do because I'm sure they're signing a non-compete. Um, so because they're not getting ten million dollars or whatever it is from Vince, and then reopening next week. So okay. um, you know, it's it's um, basically you know. You know, so is that, the, is that the deal? Ten million? What? Ten, ten to twenty, somewhere in that range is what's sure. going. I, I don't know the exact WCW? number. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Does he have to honor the contracts too, or does somebody else honor? No, no, no. He he bought the Not contracts the he wants. He bought the twenty four. He bought twenty four contracts, which were all the lower paid guys. He didn't buy any of the top guys' contracts, so he doesn't have to honor any of them. Well, then, then Turner it, has to take care of the contracts. What incentive would any of these guys oh, have to gosh. go work for somebody else if they did open up a? That's company? nothing. The 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 um the incentive is 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 if they just want to be in the spotlight, uh, or not. And and you know the the thing is is also with some of these guys you got to look at, and and Goldberg doesn't fit in this one because he's relatively young. He's um 34. But like with Page and certainly with Flair, you're talking about guys. You know Page is in his mid 40s. Flair's 52. That um, you know, boy, you know it's it's like like with Flair. Just, they better just, hope they save their money well. Yeah, but the thing with Flair, okay, like like he's got two years at eight hundred thousand. Now you can go in there and go, you know what? Maybe he can make almost as much with Vince, but you know what? It's like he's got to make that much and more because you're talking about road expenses as well that he would have. 
at, at 54, it's like he's not going to have a third year at 54 to make up, let's say, what he didn't make in these two years. So for his family, you know, unless Vince is going to offer... Flair was 40, though. Oh, come on. You know, he, he's not going to be wrestling when he's 54. <laughs> he's barely wrestling now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, unless... You know, I mean, the whole thing is, I think for most of these guys, is, is they're going to have to get an offer pretty darn close to what they're making, uh, or, or why or why turn it down? You know, yeah, unless... That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I, I don't see... I mean, Booker's going to go, you know, but 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 I don't know. You know, and, and Steiner, you know, the thing with Steiner is Steiner doesn't need to wrestle. I think he does it for... Because he wants to, or whatever, whatever the thing motivates him. I'm talking about Scott. Um, mm-hmm. Scott's already got his money, but, um, you know... Um, Again, you, you've, uh, there's just whatever different things motivate you. But I mean, if you, boy, if you're in your if you're in your mid 40s and you've got this kind of money coming in, it's pretty stupid to walk away from it and just just for the ego rush of uh, working for the WWF. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, some of them probably will, though. Well, well Dave, uh, thank you, and I wanted to uh, thank you personally again for your help earlier in the week. And uh, believe me, we will continue to bend your ear on uh, getting advice on this FMLL thing. Okay, and you know, just let us know how the how the shows are going, and when you get lineups and things like that. You know, we can always promote them and stuff. Yeah, we're, we're going to do something um, the day after Cinco de Mayo. We, we're actually uh, getting some sponsorship from uh, a radio station, so we're going to we're going to run two shows simultaneously on that day, and we just we, we'll split the main event. And we'll, we'll split the crew, and it, we'll have the main event at the top of both shows, and those are going to be free. So, you know, we're expecting huge turnouts for those. Okay, cool. Okay, guys, thank you very much, and thanks, Matt okay. and, and Brian. The Bobby Heenan thing and Gene Okerlund thing is a one-time thing, at least for now. I mean, they're just doing it for the one match. They're not signed to uh, go full-time with the WWF. Um, I guess it's a possibility that they could be the announcers on the WCW show. Um, that Those those decisions have not been made yet, though. But uh, I don't know if I would do both of them together on that show. I'd like to split uh, them up. You know, if, if they're going to use both of them, maybe. Well, they, could use, they could always use uh, Gene to do the, the interviews and have Heenan do... Um, you know the color, and then get a play yeah, by play someone guy. He- put someone with Heenan. Yeah, that's po- there are possibilities. Man, you know, it's a possibility. I don't know. Uh, it's one of the things. They haven't announced Lawler at Access yet. He's not there. Okay. <laughs> I think Lawler. Well, you know. Uh, let's see. Any word on how long Benoit Angle will be given? Let's say 15 minutes, roughly. Um, I got a feeling it could be a little more or a little less. Uh, they should get an hour. No one's getting an hour, I don't think. I, Brock and Austin may get a long time. They do got four hours to fill. Uh, let's see. This is from someone who goes, about the WWF in being big in Europe, there's no WWF in all of Scandinavia, and G- Germany no longer shows Raw or SmackDown. The only countries that are going to be showing WrestleMania are the UK Live and France on a tape delay. So they're really, really... So not, they don't have German TV. No wonder, no wonder we get so much feedback on the website from England... You know, the countries we get the big feedback on, besides the United States and Canada, it's really England, a very little Australia, and, and a decent amount of Japan. It's, it's, it's pretty, is that pretty much it? Do you get feedback from other places, Brian? That's pretty much it. You know, England, England far more than any other country, except for, you know, North, you know United States and Canada. Let's go I to... I think we got a lot of India for a while there. India? Yeah. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't remember anything from, from there. I mean, a little bit... In other countries too. Let's go to hey, Chris. What's going on? Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Um, I was looking at the. I, I downloaded that preview while I was actually on hold and watched the uh, preview of the movie that he was talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, is, when is that going to be available, or is it available now to buy? Or well, I just. Uh, I actually just kind of put the preview together to see what kind of response, how much interest it generated, and uh, I've got. It, it, I'm. I'm going to set my goal, of having to ready to go within. Four to six weeks, the, the completed, the whole movie package and everything. Because one of my problems, the, the only thing that's got me stopped up right now is music production, um, because I'm producing all the music on that on that movie as well. The the band that uh, the song I used on there is one of the bands I produced, and then we've got you know four or five other bands as well as my own music is on the movie, and, and that's the only thing that's holding me up right now. Okay. Do you think there be legal problems with the WWF? Yeah, I was going to say yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure there will be. Um, <laughs> I'm sort of geared up for that, you know. Uh, the reality of it is, is I would love to talk to Vince about this, you know. I mean, because quite frankly, it's something that has to be seen. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a great. I think it's a great story, not just because I'm in it, you know. I just think it's. 
I think it's a hell of a look that nobody's ever seen, and I think it can do a lot for the business. I think there's some some bad things, but I also think there's some you know some incredible things. So um, I think he's going to be a little bit leery after the last couple of years of. Uh, yeah, he's not, he's, not, he's, not, he's not good about he's not good about movies. I mean, every every one of those movies has resulted in in some sort of an attempt to either sabotage or lawsuits. Well, and, and uh, you know, and of course, because you know, he doesn't uh, he can't control that environment. But you know, the one thing about you know, I'll just I'll just say this is you know, is there's always the the Tommy Lee and Pamela thing. You know, once it gets out, there's nothing that can be done. So, how about I, if um, I mean, I'm, I'm at a point with I think it's such a cool deal that if I have to, I'll give it away. Now, now if Vince came to you and said, "Look, I don't want this thing getting out. I'll give you five million dollars for this movie," so well, of course you would the five million um, destroy it. Be silly. Well, be silly. You, uh, <laughs> you know, the, you know the funny part about me, guys. You know, and I know you're gonna think, you know, Max, shut up. This is crazy. You're, you know, the reality for me is, man, I, I tell you from the bottom of my heart, I'm, I'm a musical guy. I mean, I love to make music. I've spent my whole life wanting to do it. I, it. It really was the disjointed thing for me when I was in, when I was doing wrestling. I always dreamed about doing music, and I'm going to do music. And I'll tell you what, I've got a, a circle of the most incredibly talented young musicians around me right now. You can imagine, and five million dollars right now would put all of these young acts and would, <laughs> you know, would really ensure for me. Um, and really, all I want out of this is the ability to promote my own products. I really do. I just I want to help the bands that I work with. I, I, there's some really incredible talent out here where I live, and I, I really, I really just want to be somebody that turns around and invests that money in other young talent and just do music the rest of my life. I know that sounds, you know, um, rather simple, but that's the that's the reality of it all. That's uh, my goal in life is to do music the rest of my life. So, <laughs> um, I you know. I don't care about the money, though. I, I think, in, in one sense, I mean, it would be nice to have that, but I think this movie will land me all kinds of other things just simply because it's one of those things that when you see it, it it's it's pretty fascinating take, and it was all orchestrated basically by me. Yeah, I'm not, that's not an ego thing. I'm just saying I just had the wherewithal to take my camera with me and have created a, a really cool... Um, documentary of what it's like to be on the road as a wrestler, and quite frankly, I think the world needs to see that. It, just from the preview, I, I saw it, and I was just like, I was hooked to it. I just wanted to see the whole thing. So that's well, that's, that makes you feel really good. Well, then you know what, man? With people like you that are out there, if if uh, the emails and the responses I get are like that, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's going to be a difficult. I don't know what I do. You know, I really, if Vince said, you know, here here's the money, take it. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know what I do. I. It's one of those deals where. Well, I wouldn't blame you for taking it. I mean, well, there's a lot of fans <laughs> out there that you know. But he's, like, not gonna, he's not going to offer it though. Oh no, I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, he's not. Gonna, he's not going to do that. That's for sure. Not. That's not Vince's style. And the reality oh, no, of it all not. is, I'm. I'm sure. I'm. I'm. I'm pretty confident that I'll. That I'll be hearing from his legal staff. Well, how much? Um. How much like. Does Vince hold over that as far as I don't, the yeah, I don't know. on property, or is it because uh, to me, to me, they have no, they have no claim. I'll, I'll just be honest with you because, first of all, when you see the whole thing, you'll know I'm telling you the truth. The agents knew I was doing it. I got them telling jokes on camera. Yeah, you can see the look on everybody's face. You know, that, like every, you it's not like or, nobody knew that wasn't I wasn't hidden. taking video. They didn't have to participate. They could have said, "Turn that off. I don't want to be involved." But nobody did. Everybody was involved. Right. Um, and. Therefore, they they knew I had a camera. You know, I mean, when I took it into the ring, it's not. I'm not exploiting the the interior wrestling characters, and I'm not. It's not really an exploitation. It's merely a look it's that true. the wrestling business is not going to allow you to look at. You know, that they don't want you to see. They don't want you to see this kind of a movie. I think of everybody just knowing how well, like Beyond the Mat and everything did, just especially for the inside fans and the you know the internet type fans. If they caught a look at that movie, they would absolutely you'd have a you'd have a definite interest in that. I don't, I don't well, have I, any you know, about my, my goal is to be quite honest with you. I'll tell you where I think where I want to go with this, um, because it is a two level story. It's not just about behind the wrestling scenes. It's also about somebody who, you know. Took it right to the edge, man. I went right to the edge of the wrestling business and, you know, could have had it all but didn't make it. I'm, I'm the underdog, man. I'm the guy that, you know, was right there tasting it all and involved in it all. And for whatever reason, 
I didn't make it, and I think that's an incredible story to, for people to just sit down and look at. As far as um, like, did you have any? As far as the upper guys, did you get along with everybody? As far as the boys go, did you have any pop? You know, like the well, I'm pretty problem? confident that the reason that that I didn't go any further was because of Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. I was going to add. Okay. Oh my God, I never oh, that, that, that is a shocker. Yeah, that is yeah a shocker. I know that's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> but you know, when you see the that's tape, what's shocking is Brian Adams being lazy. <laughs> uh, gosh, I, I just keep going. Got some sorry, revelations man. on this Maybe show today. Maybe I can today. give you some revelations. Now, it, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, I can't tell you how many times I heard, I, "Do you honestly believe a fat, ugly guy can get over?" <laughs> and I went. Um, do you remember? Do you remember my yeah. favorite Kevin? My favorite Kevin Nash was the the day. Um, it was the day that I think it was the day he pushed that finger into Hulk Hogan. And they were all laughing, and he lost the world title to Hulk Hogan. And they were all laughing because WWF had just made Foley world champion. And he just goes, "Don't doesn't Vince realize that unless, you know, like to be the world champion, you've got to be someone that all the guys want to be like and all the girls want to be with. And I'm just thinking, and, and, and that's why Mick Foley was a big disaster. You've got to have the word champion. Mark tattooed on your forehead, too. <laughs> <laughs> my God, Kevin. <laughs> wow. I guess he just doesn't realize that there's people out there that appreciate guys like Foley and guys that work hard. And, and well, you know, I, I mean, think, that's just. I, I think Foley turned out to be a pretty big star. But it was like, I, you know, the other one, and Brian, you probably heard this one a lot, was um, the people don't recognize them at the airport. Not, not recognize, but when oh, you yeah. walk in an airport, airport. You know, that was the old, the old reason why they always wanted to push. You remember Van Hammer, of course, yeah. right, Max? Oh, they my God, do Van I Hammer Van because, Hammer? Because Van Hammer, we know a big muscular guy, and, and when you, know, you see a big muscular on the airport, you kind of do a double take. And yeah. it's like, see, people recognize him at the airport, whereas, like, some guy like Juventud Guerrero, who has more, you know, ability yeah. in his pinky, you know, it's just, you know, he's a normal-sized guy, so, you know, it's like, but, but what does that matter? We're not at airports. Like, that's not, the game isn't how many people Yeah, when you start running shows at airports. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and to be on, I'll be honest with you, it never bummed me out not to be noticed in an airport, you know, because an airport's <laughs> not some place that you go, boy, here's a great place for a photo op, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, for the love of God, I'm trying to get on a plane and get to my next destination. You know, come to the arena or whatever, you know. I mean, it's one of those times in your life where you want to just be as much like everybody else as you can. So, you know, oh, that's crazy. Okay. Uh, did you ever see Wrestling with Shadows or Beyond the Mat? I did. What did you think? I saw, the, I saw the one with uh, Brett. Yeah. Do you want do you want to hear my honest opinion or do you want me to can't No, candy we only want honest opinions. You know, I got to tell you, I was totally offended. I and I, I'm just going to tell you my gut instinct on this. Okay. Because I'm a wrong. wrestler and I and I know Bret Hart and I know that if what happened, I, I based it on this, just knowing the business. If Vince McMahon came to ringside after he'd screwed me in a shoot for real and. Stole my title, and Sean and him were in cahoots. I would have, and in my hometown, in front of my home people, I guarantee you, I would have beat his ass right in front of everybody. <laughs> well, he did it in front of everybody. So he spit on Vince McMahon from inside the ring, and I know Bret Hart well enough to know that right there was the whole part that when I went, this whole thing's a work. It's so not. I really I'm believe seriously, that whole thing seriously, was Seriously, no, I can tell. This is one of the things I actually can tell you for sure. It's not. Well, he, and he did, he did punch Vince McMahon later that night. Well, I, you know what, Dave, you might be right, but I, I tell you, I watched it from you know I got a T-shirt on my website that says at least 180, and I, I watched it the first time and I was right with you. Then I watched it again and I went, oh my god, they swerved. I mean, because the reality of it is this: is the only thing else I got to say. I'm not going to try and change anybody's p opinion, but I guarantee you. I guarantee you, whenever Vince McMahon has a camera on him, he's acting. Vince is always acting. No, no, not, no doubt about that. Vince was in that, and for him to show up with a black eye, uh, the makeup was bad. I just didn't buy it. I didn't buy any of it. I thought it was. Okay. I thought it was. Completely no, the, the the one the one thing um, I was going to say about that is after that, the, the, there's a lot of reasons I can say this, but if if they had pulled off an angle that great. And an angle that today, almost three and a half years later, people still talk about. Why didn't Brett ever go back to work for him and make money off the angle? Oh, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of reasons. Okay. I, I, I think that you know. I mean, there, you certainly. I, I first of all, it couldn't have manifested itself because the worst possible scenario happened. Uh, Brett's brother died in the WWF. So there's no way he could go back. Even you know, even now, I really believe that it was a coup. 
But, Brett, from a pride standpoint, I know if it was my brother, I certainly couldn't like Vince McMahon after that. Yeah. Especially he, the way, he, in my opinion, the way it was handled. He, he didn't like him before that. I mean, after that, uh, I, 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 I think the you're right, thing but I, I believe Vince said, sure. go get the money, and you know, if you ever need a job, you, you can come back. Let's set up a good work so we can get you as much money as you possibly can have and, and turn you babyface in your hometown. I believe Vince has enough respect for the business and the boys to do that. I really do. Uh, no, he, want, he, he, really, really, he, wanted, he wanted to kill him because he was afraid that... Uh, what he was afraid of was that because Brett was so big in Canada at that time, and WCW was dead in Canada for and still is, that all of a sudden it would open up this market that he had, and I think he wanted to uh, you know take Brett down, and it, did, it ended up backfiring. Although WCW went and and blew the opportunity. <laughs> it didn't but totally the, kill Brett though. I mean, as far as financially, because I mean he made a ton of money going over the Brett WCW. Brett made a ton of money. No, Brett, Brett made a ton of money with the WCW deal. Um, WCW was the one who blew it with Brett. As right. far I just, as like you know, using Dave, him. it's just hard for me to believe. Man, when there's a camera around, you're not seeing real Vince. That's that's all. That's the best argument I have. No, you know, there's who, a camera who, on Vince McMahon. That's not real Vince. Vince McMahon. There is no real Vince. Uh, you know what? No, I've been around Vince with no camera. camera. It's still I'll the same Vince. With that. I'll disagree with that in principle. I've sat with him in his office, mm -hmm. and I've seen a real Vince. I've seen a different side really? of Vince. And I, I think the boys that have sat with him and have seen that, you know, that side of Vince, there's something. There's something different when you sit with him in Titan and you're talking about, you know, the, the nuance of a new character and, you know, trying to develop and, and you know, get going in the business with, with the WWF. I would have to say that's probably the closest to real Vince I ever saw. I never saw it again either. So yeah. you, you know what's funny is the first time I saw Wrestling with Shadows, which was before it ever came out, when they sent me the preview, yeah. when it was over, my first reaction was, oh, my God, everyone is, every, anyone watching this that knows anything, is going to think it's a work, and I and I knew it wasn't, and I go like it because it just fits so well. Yeah, and it was just this weird thing they had they had they had too much access. Everything was perfect. Everything was so perfect. That's, I mean, yeah, that's, was, that's, know, that's like, the part like the Julie Hart Hunter question. thing. I mean, that was like so good. You you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like how, how, you know, but you know what I do? I do know what you mean. I'll tell you why. Because when you watch my movie, I honestly, I really believe people are going to think the same thing. Because there's mm -hmm. some things that happen on camera, you, you know, you're gonna go, oh my god, you're just not gonna, you're gonna go, this is all, you know, BS. I thought the funniest mm -hmm. part of it in the preview was seeing Kevin Nash hold up that bag of money, and it was just kind of symbolic while he's just sitting there holding this. Yeah, clear bag I, of I thought that was appropriate for this <laughs> week, wasn't it? And then the and the and the handful of pills behind it. Yeah, yeah I'm sure I'm gonna get a lot of hate mail from those guys. Oh boy! <laughs> but from the beak, I don't care about from uh, Paul. I, I, you know, Triple H. I used to have respect for him, but you know, I got to tell you, man, I was good. You know, and Kevin Nash as well. I'm going to say, I'll say this right out, and I'll face those punks anywhere because, you know what, Kevin Nash. I was never anything but good to Kevin Nash when I lived in Atlanta. You know, I was I was always kind. I always respected him. He he wasn't he was under me, and I was nobody. You know what I mean? He was he was still doing nothing. He was kicking dirt clods when I was in Atlanta, and you know, it's one of those things where I, I lived in the apartment building with him. I lived in the apartment building with with Hog and with uh, Dennis Knight and you know all those guys, and I was good to them. When Paul Levesque came to the WCW and did jobs as terrorizing, I went. I used to intentionally sit with with the job guys because I couldn't stand sitting in the ego room. Because the job guys were real, you know, those guys were alive and came there and oh my god, I can't wait to work and you know, even though it was it was putting somebody over, they knew that was their destiny. I had so much respect for them. And you know, I, I would watch those egos roll in every day and and Kevin as, as well. And you know what? That's just not where I didn't want nothing to do with that kind of a lifestyle. And I, I'm sad looking back in retrospect how good I was to those guys. I thought they were my friends, I really did. And I've never heard from I know, like I said, I know Kevin and Scott buried me. I know they, and that's one thing I want Vince to see in this movie is how over my gimmick was in Europe, you know, because the people are popping. You can't, you can't deny what happens in this movie when you see the whole thing that the people really dug it and had, they really given me an opportunity to explore this thing. Give me a year, you know, to really see what could come of the musical side. Things could happen, but guys like Kevin, who I thought were my friends, went up there and I'm sure just did everything they could do to bury me. And I, and I don't know why. 
Do you think it, did, did, do you think they just feared that that gimmick could have worked, and they you know just like any other case? Well, what, the what would you care? You know, what would you care if if it's going to make everybody money? Oh no, I know, I know, you know what that, 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 It very well could have been. I, it was hard for me to think like that because I always thought the deal was to try and fill the seats. You know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I I'd figured out a long time ago it wasn't about the girls and the drugs and going up and down the road. The gimmick was to try and bring the fans out. You know. That's and the fill gimmick. The seats, it's it, it's not even the pops. It's the it's the it's it's the filling the seats. It's yeah, the whole, that's yeah. the business. You get that's, that's right. the deal. That's what you it's do. Not, Your it's job not getting recognized at the airports or anything else. Yeah, and get them you know get them to come and put their butts in those seats, and 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 then we'll take it from there. Vince doesn't have a problem getting it from there. Well, that's what those guys did in WCW though over the last couple of years. That's one of the. Oh, they've, they've all just stole livings. That that's why that's the danger of the union side right there. Well, they yeah. put everybody down that had a chance of getting up. That's why I'm saying, I mean, yeah. as far as they, their logic should have been, let those guys come up so we have somebody to work with. I, we have somebody new to know, work with in fresh matches. Too, but they, you know, once that click, you, you know, I've heard you guys already use the click word, you know. Once that thing's in place, if you're if you're not a part of it, you're not a part of it. And, you know, in fairness to them sometimes, you know, I was just the kind of guy that would go overboard the other way to piss everybody off as much as I can because they pissed me off so bad. You know, the bodybuilder guys, you know, they all walked around looking in the mirror all day and all they cared about was, you know, the, the, the stuff to me that I was like, wait a minute. You know, there's more to this than meets the eye. You're missing the bigger picture. And, you know, I just, they always looked down their nose at me, so therefore I could never be a part of that clique. So Thanks, we're like totally, we're young. actually like, we, we actually gotta go, we gotta run because we're totally out of time. Okay? Yeah. Okay, I wanna thank you very much for doing the show. I wanna thank everyone for tuning in all week. And uh, thanks, Brian and Al and everybody else, all the callers. And we will be back Sunday night at midnight.